I want to tell you know that this uh, this panel is mainly about the the seminal work, the seminal theories in in the MIS field, and and today we have a very distinguished professors, and, and we are very honored that they are already with us today because uh, they are the best uh, representatives of of of, of the MIS uh, research in in our field. So I'm very pleased to present uh, the three main panelists. I will, I will start with Eleonore. Eleonore Loaekono, she's a she's an associate professor, and William William and Mary uh, Raymond Mason School of Business, uh, and she she has been she has been uh, working for many years in the MIS fields, and she's uh, she's co-founder and director of the Inclusive Design and Accessibility Idea Hub at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and her research center on the intersection of technology and the user. She's very really well recognized for her study in uh, technology and the use of, of the MIS theories in the uh, service quality field. And she is well recognized for his instrument and work file that she, she developed uh, and, and used for many researches in, in our field worldwide. Um, the second uh, is uh, George Maracas. He's um, he's um, um, author and scientific investigator and professor at Florida International University. He is a professor of the Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics at the College of Business. She is uh, mainly in the areas of corporate transformation, human computer interaction, and the Internet of Things. She is uh, very well recognized in the field, and he is a permanent member of, of, of uh, the, the Association for Information Systems and regular in, in AMSIS uh, every year. Uh, so, we are very happy to have him have you here, uh, George. And the third panelist, uh, we, we are very happy to have uh, Fred Niederman. He's always supporting the guys. He's always in our uh, uh, activities and the research seminars before. And he is a professor at the St. Louis University School of Business. And he's, he mainly works in the areas of uh, philosophy of science, applying to information system, IT computer, ethic computer mediating group system, and project management. He is uh, also uh, uh, very well recognized in research. He has been, uh, he is an uh, editor in chief of Communication of Association for Information System Journal, a very, a very well recognized journal in our field. She is in the editorial board on the department co-editor and IS project management of the Project Management Journal. He is a senior editor for the Journal of the Association for Information System, uh, co-program chair of the International Conference on Information System, and and a lot of other great titles that um, so we are very happy to have all of you here. And we have um, we, we expect to have a very good discussion about uh, the seminal theories in the MIS field. We prepare I prepare some questions for starting the discussion. Uh, uh, one of the first questions that uh, we wanted to start is what is the relevance of the MIS discipline today? What do you think that this is the relevance of the MIS discipline today? I don't know. Is Eleanor is is uh, preparing? It's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would love for George or Fred to to take that one first. I think they've they've had a lot more experience in that. Okay. Well, somebody has to start, and uh, Thank you, George. you know, uh, I'll I'll begin. The question was, what is the relevance of the field? Um, well, I, I think that's pretty easy. It, it, it's very relevant. It's uh, we you know we we have. We focus on the on the relationship between information, its technology, and and human decision making, and our field kind of lives at that nexus uh, that uh, that is created by that. Um, I I got involved in this, and I may have I may be the guilty party for actually spawning this particular discussion because uh, at the last AMSIS we had a great presentation. Uh, looking back on Gary Dixon's life and contribution to the field. And then we had a panel discussion with some with some senior scholars that uh, focused on the let's let's have our annual identity crisis discussion uh, where um, gee, you know, where's the field going? Where's the field been? Who are we? What are we? Are we relevant? Blah, blah, blah. OK. Uh, it, it, I call it the annual identity crisis because I remember as a doctoral student some 30 years ago hearing the same discussion by this by senior scholars and 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 others. Um, so that got me 
wondering why we, we can't find something else to talk about besides our identity crisis. And I went from that session, which was a great session, to uh, meeting with a group of doctoral students at the, the AIS Doctoral College and sat at a table full of very bright students. And uh, I just out of the blue said, um, does anybody, have you ever read any work by Gary Dixon? No. Uh, did you know who Gary Dixon was in that last session? Not really. Uh, have you ever read anything by Keene? No. Checkland? No. Churchman? No. Tycro? Dixon? Davis? You know, I'm running out of names here. Um, they were very bright. Now, doctoral students are a, a handcrafted product. It's the only handcrafted education that we have. So that means that the doctoral students uh, can be the beneficiary or the victim of whoever decides to teach them. Uh, if we're not um, focusing on the, the roots of this field, that is at least one realistic hypothesis that would suggest that without a focus and anchor on the roots of the field, we continue to struggle with the identity of the field. Uh, and I, I, I just, I lament that because I think, um, I, you know, I, I'm just one of those believers that you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. I'll open that to somebody else. Brad or Eleanor? Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, Gary Dixon, and uh, he was my advisor on my dissertation committee. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of what I would call the second wave. We were not the founders of the field, but we were the students of the founders and had firsthand access to their stories. Uh, some of whom are still with us, um, uh, uh, many fairly aged uh, now, uh, uh, but um, um, often still a source of, uh, of great wisdom and, and, and history. We've just started a, 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 pro, a history, we've had a history section, history and philosophy, but I split them apart in CIS because I think they're, they're pretty different from each other. And we've started a feature called In Their Own Words, where we get senior folks to talk about uh, in a more personal way, their own experiences, like critical events that they experienced. So far, we have two published, uh, Blake Ives and uh, Dick Mason. Uh, and I'm hoping to invite more people uh, from around the world, not just you know um, uh, the people who started ISIS and um, MIS Quarterly. Um, Gary, I, I don't know, I don't even know if he's still alive, but he's been incommunicado for many years now. So uh, if I can, if I could get him to do something, but I really doubt it. Um, it's very interesting because in some ways, the work of those early folks has aged well, and in some ways it has aged poorly. Um, with a evolving, if you think of uh, socio-technical as the integration of technology and people, uh, 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 building on what George was saying, and information data, um, uh, then the evolution of technology is at such a rate that it's guaranteed that some aspects of the field will be constantly changing. It's also, in my view, underrated how much stays the same. And I think that the effort of people in the research community has been to focus on the things that stay the same because the argument would be that in five years, do you want to have written about AI and now it's a completely different thing and your, your work is irrelevant. And I think we see that with some of the early uh, it's not irrelevant completely, but it's um, it's about obsolete technologies. And, and the standard things that people do with any technology may apply, but it's a fraction of what was said at the time, uh, I think. Um, George mentioned a fellow named Peter Keene, and he may or may not be familiar to everybody on the call. He wrote a very famous paper in 1980 at the first ISIS, and I think did a tremendous disservice inadvertently to the field when he talked about reference disciplines. Now, why do we have so many reference disciplines uh, referred to in IS? I believe it's because when the field was starting, there was a huge shortage of teachers uh, and people trained in, in IS. So many, many people recruited from all over business and psychology and other places. So they started, so they took two classes in COBOL 
and started teaching COBOL. But all of their mindset remained operations management or psychology or economics. And I really think that the cost to the field, there's many benefits to the field, but I think the cost of the field is very little, um, uh, what's the word, uh, inductive research looking at the actualities of people interacting with computers rather than computer science looking at building better computers and pseudo IS people who are psychologists looking at trust when it happens to be about Facebook instead of about um, bullies on the playground or something and testing whether the same theories hold when you introduce IT, but not necessarily looking at what happens and what the dynamics are in the IT environment and building what, what the thinking is from that. So in my view, there's a lot of moving toward the future a little bit and toward the ultimate discussion here of what, what would be future-oriented research people could do. Um, so I think that inductive looking at people while they're interacting with technology uh, is, is a hugely underdeveloped area of our field. Not zero. There's a fair amount of it. I tend to value much more qualitative uh, research looking at the 50 people who are actually using an ERP system rather than a survey extracting their summarized Likert scale uh, uh, values, which may mean a whole range of different things when they're actually filling out the forms. I mean, I know this from my own filling out a form. Now, that said, these are not always the prevalent dominant paradigm and easy to publish. Uh, one last thing I, I would say, just so I make sure I get it in, because it has nothing to do with the question. Um, I recently had the honor to write a, a, an editorial with Alex and Guillermo for the Journal of Global Information Technology Management, I think. And there's a great book I read about 30 years ago about the history of psychology in India. And you know, India was a British colony and started out studying the psychology of the British as it would be in, in India. Then they started actually translating things into Hindi and Urdu, go figure, instead of all in English. Then they started looking at whether or not these issues applied there. Then eventually they started looking, at, well, what issues are there in India that we want to know about? So I believe one of the themes of our paper, and you guys uh, can correct me, is what are the issues in Panama and Brazil and Chile and uh, Bolivia? You know, it's not necessarily installing an ERP in a 50,000 person company. It might be how do we find the right enterprise systems for our sorts of work? How do we deal with the workforce where technically we speak English, but for 60% of people, it's a second language and prone to a lot of misunderstandings. So how do we balance these language? How do we balance cultural issues? Um, what are needs that we living in the States in St. Louis don't even see, are just blind to? Uh, there's some great management writing about uh, low cost development being the new frontier. They weren't thinking about IT in particular. And, and I really think there's a huge market for global IT that says we're going to forget about the dominating issues of MISQ and ISR and look at what's real to the people who live here. And, and, and this is a open door at CIS. And I've gotten in two and a half years almost zero papers uh, that that just say nuts to, you know, uh, uh, you know, Europe and the U.S. and Australia. No offense if for anybody who's calling in from there. And what are our problems and how do we solve them? What's important to us? Sorry, I went on a long time. But. Thank you, Fred. I think it's very interesting, your, your question. And I think uh, that we have to look at uh, Latin America in a way that, you know, we are facing many special issues here. And even though Latin America is, you call Latin America, every country in there is different at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we are not similar to Brazilians in Chile or to Argentinians. You know, we, we, we laugh about our differences all the time. So that's yeah, we, very you see that and look at Haiti and Dominican Republic on the same yeah. island. Exactly. Uh, two different languages, vastly different amount of wealth. Exactly. So, hey, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I just wanted to jump in because I wanted, because uh, I am the, I guess the third generation then, I guess, because I, my advisor was somebody who was from Minnesota, kind of that second. Um, 
And one of the things that I think, you know, why is, is IT relevant? We're here, right? We're studying it. Um, there's people still interested in it. So I, I do think it's relevant. A couple of points I wanted to make. One is that um, I think we were in, in the beginning when we were having an identity crisis, um, it was very much stifling our field in some ways because um, there were things that I was told, um, you know, we don't talk about the dark side of IT, right? We don't talk about, you know, gender's already been done. Um, you know, we talk about the typical user, right? Because we were very scared, I think, about being accepted as a field. I think that the thing that I'm finding actually energizes me about being in this field is the fact that we have come so far as to say, we're going to study those things and we have social inclusion as, as an area. And we, we are, you know, looking at different, different things out there, such as gender and taking, you know, looking at different theories to apply to that. Um, so for me, I think that that's really important. And I think that's, what's keeping us growing. And I think it's, it's not, it's important to look back and to understand the past. I think it's also important to understand where we are because those same things that Fred, you were talking about, I think are really important in, in when we talk about social inclusion um, is looking at, you know, we are not all the typical user, right? Who is the typical user anymore? We have people with disabilities. We have people coming from um, different countries using different languages and that. And so really looking at situational uh, issues is, is important too. And so one, I would say that that's, that's important. Um, and the other thing I would probably like to ask Fred or George on this, because this is something that I ran into and I think is something that um, is worth kind of talking about. So it, you had talked about psychology. And one of the things that I have done is a lot of research kind of looking at affect in that. And what I found um, is that there was this disconnect between where, if so if we have past literature in IS that looks at psychology, um, it has been taken in a, a snapshot at a specific time. So if you look at what um, has been done in the early 90s or 90s into the 2000s, right? A lot of people who are looking at psychology now, the psychology discipline has moved. And so there may be different ways of looking at it, right? And so I always get, you know, we're, we want to be at the cutting, we want to be at the cutting edge and what's the, the right thing, but sometimes citing previous papers that are in the IS literature may be behind. Um, and so I do, I do think I'm not you know, saying that there's an answer that you should have the answer, but I think as a, it, it's important that we look at that. We do reference other disciplines and that it's a good thing. Um, but sometimes you run into this where, how do you confront, I guess is, is maybe that's not the right word, but how do you discuss a paper that may have changed from when that was written in the IS discipline to where that another discipline is. And so I think that's something um, that we shouldn't. We shouldn't run away from. I think it's something that it, you know, all all fields are realizing this because things are becoming more interdisciplinary. So it's hard to study one thing without on the periphery something else coming in. And so I don't know if you want to um, address that. Or... I would definitely reinforce what you're saying, but but perhaps take it a bit farther. Uh, I think we do a hell of a lot better job of referencing other disciplines than we do our own because it's easier. It's easier. I mean, you know, a, a doctoral student's, a, a scholar's evolution. Uh, when, when I was a doctoral student, this was the literature. Today, what they've done is this instead of this. It's a very weak graphic with my hands, but, you know, we're low tech here. Um, the literature should get bigger, not move. Okay. The anchor is the anchor. Where it started is where it started. It is either relevant or it is not. It, if, it, if it is not, make the argument it is no longer relevant and discard it. Improve upon that theory or accept it. Uh, what's happened is our field, in many cases, has adopted what should have been appropriate waves of fashion and turned them from topics to disciplines. It, 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 you know, um, health information systems. Health information systems is not irrelevant, but what's interesting is many of the people that are studying in the health information or researching in that area can't tell me what's special about it. All of the theories with regard to implementation, user usability, uh, user involvement, all of those theories came from the 70s and 80s and 90s. In theory, we should have already solved the problems that the health information systems people say they have. What the difference is, is those were all solved in a mono-constituency environment. 
one constituency of user, one constituency of developer, and, and one system. In the, in the health field, we have multiple constituencies, often with conflicting goals, and so those theories no longer apply. They're not trying to revise the theories, they're re reinventing them. And what is that old, you know, what's the old saying, you know, he who's, who fails to acknowledge history is doomed to repeat it? Okay, we spend an awful lot of time uh, stating things that have already been stated in, in, in some eloquent, in new eloquent manner. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, going to the psychology literature and saying, because Sirka Yarbanpah decided to study trust once, trust is now an IS field. And I as discipline, it's, it, it's no, it's not. And Circa would be the first one to tell you that. And I dare say there may be very, there may be many people on this call who don't know who I'm talking about. That's the point of this discussion. We have, we have lost, uh, I don't know, maybe it was too hard to make the literature this big. So let's just keep moving it. Okay. Uh, you know, a, a, AI is decision support systems with autonomous technology. Fred will know this. I, I'm working on a paper and and have and struggling with the paper because many that focuses on autonomy as causality. I've gotten reviews back from from I know qualified people who wanted to tell me, well, there's nothing special about autonomous technology. Let's take a burglar alarm for example. A burglar alarm is not autonomous technology. A burglar alarm is an electronic switch that is in direct control of its user. Now, either we're dealing with people who don't understand causality and autonomy, or we're dealing with people who don't understand the roots of it, which came from churchmen and inquiring systems and, and Tycro, uh, you know, now that I have to remember them. Well, Mumford, uh, Bostrom, uh, you know, uh, and, and even Checklin. Uh, these are the roots of our system. I, I have no problem if somebody wants to, to discount or debate or simply say that's wrong. But first of all, you have to have the target to point at instead of just ignoring the target and saying, well, I'm just going to reinvent it and, and, or ignore it. And, and I, I think that's a crime. Uh, if I can add one more quick thing, um, and I think it's our fault. Okay, our doctoral students are going to do what we tell them to do. It's, it's really that simple. And despite what the education field will say, at the end of the day, you will teach the way you learned. Exactly. And if, if you did not learn the roots of your field, you will not teach the roots of your field. You don't even know they exist because you trusted that mentor to prepare you for the academy. Yeah. Alexandre has a question. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way that we, even when we, we claim that we don't want to get back into the identity, identity crisis, I uh, think we do get into that. When, when George uh, first uh, gave his definition of uh, information systems and he, he meant that it should be for to improve uh, the decision making by humans now we get to artificial intelligence and to autonomous uh, things and then we we think uh, well how, how does that respond to human decision making uh, and again we have to to think are we focused on the technologies themselves so are we focusing on the objects on on or, or defining good objectives so it's more of a remark I, I do think that we, we we have this constant identity crisis because because of that we are I mean we have these fancy technologies that uh, give us a, or promise us a, a better world and, and then we uh, and they were surely shaped by some human up to now uh, with uh, his or her own intentions or their own intentions uh, and we are the guys who are there uh, that are not committed to to the industry or whatever that could have a let's say I can't say that we have, we have an unbiased view but at least we're not biased by the direct involvement of, of organizations, companies, and whatsoever. But I, I do think that we are always back to the, the identity crisis because our target seems to be to keep moving. And I, and I see that Fred was, was already there trying to say something about that. Uh, I, I have a number of comments, if, if I may. And most go back to what George was saying, but a little bit to what Alexander was bringing up also. Um, first of all, uh, and this goes back to Eleanor, actually, I think philosophically we need to think about what does it mean when something gets published? Too often, people act as if that's now true. When something's published, it is not true, but it's not false. It's what I would think of as the current best guess. So when you've published something that's based on theory of reason action, which I find very questionable in terms of its relevance to IS, this has been supplanted by um, 
better research on different philosophical uh, basis, a, a psychological basis by, uh, her name's escaping me, um, African-American woman wrote with Rick Watson and uh, Boudreau. Um, uh, I, I know because I was one of the editors at GIS that finally accepted after about six other places she went to. And they looked at evolutionary psychology. So if the attitude is everything is tentative, then it's relatively easy to say, hey, look, we have this old stuff, but psychology has given us this new stuff. Let's go back and test it. But, you know, you cannot publish in any of the basket of aid a paper that has the word replication in it. It will immediately get, you'll, you'll get an immediate response. Like, well, we have another journal for that. Mm -hmm. so my view, and I've written an editorial on uh, a paper on this in EJIS, is that if you publish a paper saying X, Y, and Z theory is supported, and now Alex has a new paper that refutes it, you have an obligation to publish that. Unless you unless there's obvious weaknesses in, in the way you collected data or something. And you call it a replication because then people find it looking at it that way also. You can't publish that. It's it's a it's a as taboo a word, you know, as as, mm -hmm. as you'll find in our field. Um, second is I think we have way more published work than contribution. Contribution is secondary, I think, on the mind of about 60% of the papers I receive to review. Getting public. I get letters from people saying, uh, I'm coming up for tenure and I need to have this evaluated fast. I don't get letters from people saying, how could I add value to this so there's more of a contribution to the field? I've never gotten one. I will now, since you people have heard me say it, maybe. But you said I'm getting it. So it's very understandable. I mean, if you don't get tenure, if you don't get promoted, you're kind of out of the field. Although everybody I know who's not been promoted has gotten very good jobs in industry or in schools where what they do well is valued. Um, uh, we overvalue research in general. And really, there's only probably 10% of schools with PhD programs that give a rat's butt about whether you publish an MIS quarterly or database. You know, uh, I get uh, uh, notes from people from India and China saying they'd rather uh, so, uh, send in to CIS because we give quick turnaround. And it's how many things they publish, believe it or not, rather than where it's published uh, in some schools. I don't know about everyone. Um, by the way, Jarvin Paul was not the first to write about trust. We had a fellow, a PhD student named Brian Dobing, who wrote about trust back in about 1984, could not get published. All of the editors, when he sent them, said trust is not an IS topic. And um, it just took time for people to move into positions of being editors that did value it. Just, just a, an historical point. Nothing, you know, uh, he ended up getting a job at a small school in Canada and being very bitter the rest of his life, Brian Doming. Brilliant guy. Shelves of classic literature that he read. Uh, causality is another topic we could talk about forever. I believe causality is inherited from the physical sciences and should not be a word in our vocabulary. We're talking about influence. If I tell a good joke, it doesn't cause Alexander, uh, Al, I'm sorry, Alex, I, I just see it on the screen and I'm reading it. Um, it doesn't cause him to laugh. He may be thinking about um, something very serious, AIDS or something, and, and maybe a friend of his just told him that he had it and doesn't laugh. So it doesn't cause him to laugh, but it's a very strong influence. We have no causes, in my opinion, in social science. We have no um, causation, but we have influences. Documenting the range of things that influence. Examining in certain circumstances why one thing influences more than another. Ease of use came up when we did grounded theory on adoption. But it's one of 30 things. And I don't even know what it means. Because, you know, my Apple 7, I, I don't even know how, I don't even know my password. Okay, and I don't know how to change it. I need a 13 year old for that. But my point is that what makes something easy to use is completely independent of the technology, not completely. Uh, uh, an Apple 13 may be easier to use than Apple 7 for 90% of people, but it doesn't cause use. It's a very strong influence. And when our terminology is out of alignment with what we're really doing, it makes our research irrelevant to some communities like the practitioner community. Our research that's published in the basket of eight is irrelevant to anybody I ever talked to in practice. Condensation of that in, in, in like MIS quarterly executive occasionally 
is almost equally irrelevant, although sometimes relevant. But when consultants repackage it in terms of, uh, you know, hype, uh, and and to Eleanor's point, not talking about the dark side, just just the benefits, then it's very relevant to them. If if I could just yeah. put a finer point on one thing, it, you know, we, we we all bring our biases to the table, and and I think that's a great part about scholarship. Uh, but you know, throughout my career, I've been hearing this this repeated echo. We need to be more relevant to practice. We need to be more relevant to practice. And and my response is, who says? We're you know we're training our doctoral students to go into a field of theoretical research. Theoretical research isn't applicable. Theoretical research is descriptive. Our job is to generate knowledge. Our job is to challenge knowledge. Our job is to is to extend knowledge. I would love to believe that someday, while I'm here or after I'm gone, something that I have done, some theoretical uh, perspective that I have been involved in. Uh, results in a lens that the applied community can use to solve their problem. But I'm not getting paid to do that. I'm getting paid to be a theoretical researcher. I was trained to be a theoretical researcher, and I sleep very well at night not worrying about the applied community as a result. So I, I, I'll make two counterpoints to that, because I, I agree with you. We get paid to do research if we're at universities that value that. Uh, I would argue that 60% of IS faculty are not at that kind of university. I'm at one that's sort of quasi that. But most of us are expected to teach and train undergraduates and graduate students who will be going into practice. You know, our, I, the, the doctoral program I was in, we learned programming, we learned uh, uh, IS architecture. I don't think they teach that at the bulk of, of, of doctoral programs anymore. I, 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 I mean, mine's rusty. I could not go into um, Google and make a contribution, uh, I, I don't think. But the second thing is, if we don't have a strong link, even if we don't directly do the research, but have a strong linkage to things that are of relevance, then they're not gonna show up when they when we ask them for things. Our accounting faculty have about 30 scholarships from accounting uh, of, of practitioners. Our IT had one until I stopped managing it for uh, SIM, Society of Information Management. Now we have zero. During the, the downflow uh, in the early 2000s, accounting but when they had a downflow in student demand they would call their 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 accounting people and they would come and give pep talks to their students i would call our it people around the area and they would say we don't have time we're not interested so i mean you read the accounting literature and it's extremely relevant each article to a really small group uh, you read the marketing it's extremely relevant to a small group in uh, some of it uh, it's getting more and more esoteric too and a lot of it's no more relevant, uh, I think, than ours. Now, relevance is not the only criteria, and I'm not saying it should be, but I think that the field as a whole loses something and has a big risk if it abandons relevance. Not that every individual should be judged on that. Lord knows, George, you you make a great contribution. I've read your work for 30 years now. Uh, and uh, when I talk about contribution versus publication, you're a great example of somebody who's, who's very interested in both, uh, and certainly in contribution. I remember one of the first articles I ever reviewed, uh, you wrote with Miriam Malavi. Uh, and uh, I gave a great feedback to accept it. And then the other reviewers foudlerized it, and cut out the guts of it. You guys are good enough to go along with the other reviewers who often are wrong, frankly. But that's a it, it got published. It, it did, but, and it had still the same results and the same merit. It just, it just had a great uh, methodology of looking at before and after cognitive maps. And they didn't understand that, the other reviewers. And I just want to add to, to Fred's point real quick. I, I do think that, I mean, I understand where we are raised in a sense, right, to, to look at theory and to do that. But I also think that um, the passion of why people do this um, a lot of times is that impact. And I, I go back to there was some studies that looked at why women in particular, how do you get women into the STEM fields and that, right, and, and, and computer science and, and the impact is a huge part of what motivates um, women to often get into that. And so um, I, I don't think that we should be going away from that theory, but I think, and, and that, um, that that's our job. But I do think that looking into these things and knowing that it will have an impact or what that may be in, um, puts a little fire in people and, right, and, and energizes them to do it. And, and so to me, I do think of looking at the 
relevance and how it could help because I do think that that's how people look and see how they uh, can value what they're doing. And, I, and talking to, I mean, I'm looking at it from a gender perspective because that's some of the research I do, but I do think a lot of people when they're excited about it do better research. Um, in terms of what the, the practicality can be. And it, it's not just that. I'm not saying, I don't want to contradict what George is saying, that we weren't raised to look at it from a theoretical perspective. But I do think that that is a, an important part. And I myself am more energized when I can say, hey, I'm looking at this from this perspective, and it's going to help show, shed light on this particular area. I think, I think we're, all, we're all violently agreeing. What is that, you know, that term of violently agreeing? Um, we're all looking at the field holistically from a 360 degree perspective and we're kind of walking around it and somebody, you know, I'm saying this and Eleanor saying this, Fred saying this and so forth. And I think, you know, it's the, it's the, the parable of the three blind men and the elephant. Uh, oftentimes when we look at that, I, I would never, I would never want to be left being interpreted as saying we should not be relevant. Uh, that's, that, that, that's about as far away as I can imagine. Um, what I do believe is that <clears throat> this constant um, race that we are in to be relevant uh, it puts us on that wave of fashion. Gee, what's the what's the hottest thing? Cybersecurity. You know, I defy anyone in the information systems field to show me information systems topics relevant to cybersecurity, unless you want to talk about the psychological effect of being in a in a cybersecurity attack. Uh, you want to talk about the, uh, the, the psyche that uh, results in a cybersecurity hacker. Those are all social science issues. Very important. Not sure whether they are, in fact, IS rooted, but the IS people say, well, you know, in cybersecurity, it's cool. Let's jump on it. Uh, health informatics is cool. Let's jump on it. AI is cool. Let's jump on it. And the problem is jumping on it is not the way you develop uh, a sound theoretical foundation for research. Uh, I, I, it just it, it, it defies logic that people who are attempting to do research in IS and decision making don't have a clue about decision theory, have no idea what Gorey and Scott Morton said, and, and, and as a result are either making it up as we go, reinventing it somehow in a, in a, in a bastardized, if you will, form, and, and, and resolving problems that we've already solved instead of really going climbing higher than the low-hanging fruit and 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 really expanding what we know instead of just regurgitating I, I I'm not a cynic by the way I have great faith in this field okay <laughs> uh, I could quit a long time ago I've got you know but but I, I just can't get enough of it okay yeah. I just wish we could admit that um, that we've lost sight of our roots in a diluted form, meaning that, that there's probably more people out there that have not focused on the root structure of our literature than have. And as a result, this dilution at the periphery uh, creates a whole new generation of people that and, and scholars that uh, don't have any roots and therefore they're quite comfortable with let's proliferate the annual IS, you know, identity crisis discussion. Guillermo's had his hand up for like yeah, ever. Yeah, I yeah, I wanted to tell <laughs> yeah, Guillermo, come in. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to uh, poke uh, George on the ribs a little bit, but uh, now he already uh, on his way out, so no problem. Oh, I did, and, uh, okay. <laughs> and then just probably uh, ask him, well, comment that the fact that maybe the, the level of practicality of a research is a matter of context and is, is uh, who what community we're serving, right? And how immediate these uh, applications need to be there. Now, it doesn't say that if I do some uh, research that is quite immediately applicable, I cannot build theory behind it. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes hand in hand. And I was I wanted to ask Fred to explain to our audience, because the, no, uh, keep in mind that the audience is very novice to the field, uh, what is the basket of eight? Oh, because we sure. talk about terms that we know, but we know that we, they don't know. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> about 20 years ago, um, a, a bunch of people who are waiting for their airplanes after the end of ISIS, which finished about noon, started getting together for lunch and talking. And that was the origin of something that's now called the College of Senior Scholars. And it became relatively formalized with something like six different categories of people that are automatically members if they choose to accept being members. About 15 to 20 years ago, that group- the, Sort of it, Mount it, Olympus, it, isn't it? Sorry? So, sort of Mount Olympus, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it, it's 
it's a funny organization. Let's just put it that way. And um, so one of the ideas was that being senior people in the field, they might be able to band together to have more influence, for example, with getting papers into lists that are accepted at schools. So they came up with this idea and they ended up choosing six journals and then adding two more about five years later. And for whatever reason, it came to be called the Basket of Eight from the College of Senior Scholars. And um, it includes four that are traditionally viewed as uh, American, as North American, um, MS Quarterly, ISR, uh, Journal of Management Information Systems, uh, one's escaping me, and four that are more often looked at as European, European Journal of IS, Information Systems Journal, Journal of Strategic Information Management, and again, another one that, that is escaping me. I think GAIS. It's a journal. J -A -I -S. Yeah. yeah, why would I forget that one? That's our and, AIS. And ISJ, isn't it? I thought I said Information Systems Journal, ISJ. I think you just said Information Systems Research, I don't know. I know, I missed, I missed one somewhere. Well, those are the ones. And so at a certain set of schools, Every three years, I think it is, the senior scholars does a review of the basket of eight. I was on this committee for, for two times, and we do a survey of all AIS members. And both times it came out roughly the same. A quarter of the respondents felt there were too many journals. These are, I don't, they were anonymous, but I'm guessing these are people at places like University of Texas that only count two journals as qualifying. Um, another quarter felt it was just right and even if it wasn't, you shouldn't change it because people are now counting on it. It's become a fact. They're like changing the red light, green light at a traffic stop to mean the opposite of what they do. You'd have all sorts of accidents. The third group said it's not big enough. There should be eight to 10 more journals like database and uh, decision support systems. And the other fourth said there shouldn't be one at all. It should just be go away because it's a bit more harmful than good. So no action could ever be taken because people feel that differently uh, about them. Um, and uh, so that's, so that's the, the College of Senior Scholars now does about six or eight things. There's an annual ISIS panel. Um, they have a best paper of the year award that they do. And I don't know what else. I've, I, I was fortunate to be one of the members since 19, uh, 2010 because I was a program chair at ISIS that year. And that's one of the six things that's, that gets you a membership and I was recruited by a fellow named Alan Lee who got a bunch of work dumped on him and wanted somebody to delegate it to and uh, so I did a lot of the work for about five years. So uh, Guillermo does that that's probably way more of an answer than you were looking for. Yeah that was perfect thank you Fred. Sure may I make a comment on a different topic? Yeah. George brought up health information systems. I'm guessing we get 20 papers a year submitted to CIIS that I would call health information systems. And I have to go through and, and figure out which ones of these to move forward and which not to, uh, which to give to reviewers. I'd like to start a department that just looks at that because it, you know. Now, my litmus test is, is this only about healthcare? Why would an MIS person want to read this? Now, healthcare is important. It's one of the 17 United Nations critical things, far more important than, you know, TAM studies, in my opinion. But it isn't necessarily one that should be in CIS. And I have a list of other journals that I routinely send to people. So some of these should be in healthcare journals. Then there are journals that are intermediate, that are IS healthcare journals. Now, they try to blend, uh, or let's look at this one. They do what George is saying and take IS stuff and just translate into healthcare and say, well, you're saying this about you know um, retail, and we don't care about that. Right? Or you're saying you found these things in retail and we don't care about that. Um, and you have the subset of things that are life and death, like x-ray machines or whatever. And then you have the things that are business oriented, like ERP, that just translate but have these problems like in academia. We have to translate transcripts and what you owe you know, in your, in your billing into one system for an ERP. So some of their problems are just like any other business and others are unique. And uh, so the ones that are like, you can test generic theory as to whether it applies in their area. Ones that are unique, you can find, like there was a big sub literature by Mitroff and Mason decades ago on 
crises. It is kind of more in the management, but they publish them in IS too. What does an airplane pilot do when you have five different languages and you don't understand any of them completely? And that's a lot of where mistakes get made. And that, I think, has been corrected a lot. Uh, I think that had an impact and has become more standardized and have more training and stuff in airplane pilots. But you have the same thing in healthcare. So it becomes a decision. Is there something that an IS person can take away from this healthcare or should, maybe most won't, but, but should be able to? And that becomes my decision making uh, across this whole range, right? The same with global information systems, the kind of thing I was talking about with Alex and Guillermo and looking at the problems that are unique to Brazil or unique to Chile or that are unknown whether they cross all of Latin America, maybe African parts of South Asia too, and all of the old Soviet Republic, right? That, that still may have common issues in development, uh, getting capital, uh, things like that. So. Uh, the, the, the point is that these are, my, my wish is to have more that challenge me to bring things that I think IS people should be interested in into, into our journal. Um, it's, um, it's tough. I, I, I love asking people to write things, understanding they're going to be reviewed. But I hate when people do that and I have to say no, because it's not, you know, um, what I had in mind or, or within the range that, that works. So I've kind of stopped doing that a lot, but I do welcome these kind of papers. It's it's tough. It's tough to find truly innovative papers because innovation is tough, you know. And that's our goal with CIS is is and so we get a lot of things that are about the latest technology, Internet of Things these days. Um, I like the ones that are sort of second level. We had one that was about a kind of recommender system that's not widely used yet, or may or may not be. So I'm not looking at TAM for recommender systems, but I'm, look, I'm looking, I, I love to have design science. And I don't care a hoot about kernel theory. In fact, I think it's a, it should be what you design should create the theories, the design principles that if you build design, if you build artifacts based on existing design theory, design principles, you've given more information about whether they work across contexts. And, and I mean, we have a huge body of design principles, whether from IS or uh, engineering or computer science. But that's where a lot of the new, it, it deals with innovation, it deals with development, it deals with, you know, why should I adopt something? Well, it's partly because of the character of the technology. But in most studies, that's kept constant. Uh, I go on and on about this. Yeah, I think, I think uh, great. Um, and George, what you say is very relevant because um, I remember when you were writing Chile for, for Confirm, uh, you were, most of the editors that were there were talking about design science as a, as a main theory. And that, I mean, as a main way of, of for, for research to be published. But uh, at, the, at the same time, our programs are not teaching design science. That's, that's, a, that's a cruel thing because they are, they are, they are behind the, 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 the possibilities to publish uh, in a way that uh, most of the journals are looking for those topics. So, in, in your in your more uh, the three of us in your perspective, what could be you know what could be the the, 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 the research and the seminar work that the students should look at uh, when they are starting to think about uh, about writing a, a, a good research article or, or doing a good research uh, study. Well, you know we've raised we've raised. Um... A lot of issues here that that are relevant to, but also tangential to, you know, the the, the source of the conversation. But uh, we talk about design science. Uh, Fred has mentioned qualitative work. Um, again, I think I think this is a, a a training and and matter of perspective. Design science is a research methodology. It's a way of looking at something. It's a way of exploring something. Qualitative research is a way of exploring something. Heck, postmodernism is a way of exploring something. Um, I have no problem. I have absolutely no problem with with design science. What I have is that most people don't know how to do it, but they think they do. I have no problem with 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 great qualitative research. The problem is not too many people know how to do it or are willing to put the effort in to do a qualitative study. Uh, so we revert to positivism, and, and there's nothing wrong with with that. Uh, but but. If we're training our students properly, 
we train them to know that design science, qualitative research methods, case study, field experiment, and all the positivist uh, adjectives and adverbs uh, are tools. And once you have a sound research question, and once you have uh, a, a focus for your research, and once you have a comprehensive understanding of what we already know, that's when you can think about methodology. But I've literally run across students that say, well, I, 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 most of my work is, in, is qualitative. That's, that's weird, isn't it? You know, the only questions that you ever come up with lend themselves to qualitative methods and nothing else? Or is it possible that all your work's qualitative because that's the only thing you know how to do? And I think, again, that gets back to fundamental seminal training. Are we training our students based on what we're interested in that year? Or are we training our students to be information system scholars? Yeah, thank you, George. I don't know, Eleanor? I, mean, I, I think it's hard to say, you know, specifically what they should be looking at in terms of theory, because they should just be looking at doing a literature review that comes up with what they should be looking at. Right. And, and so um, for P, you know, the PhD students that I work with, it's always been, OK, you're interested in this. You need to go out and you need to start looking at all the articles and that that talk about that. Right. What theories are they using? What is it that that's. Um, you know, and, and we're talking start with the basket of eight, do whatever it is that, you know, so that they get familiar with the area um, and then start to do the literature on that. And then usually, you know, it'll come up with how people have, because if somebody's looked at it from a particular lens before and that's been done, you either have to say, okay, I'm, I'm doing something new, adding something to that, or I see it differently with what the, what the question is. Um, so to me, I think it really depends. I mean, you know, I've done surveys for things. I've done qualitative research. Um, I've done case studies. I mean, you know, the, you, you do, as George said, have to see what is your question and then how do you answer that question? And to do that, you know, you first have to understand in the literature what has been done and what have what lenses have people looked through to then say, OK, what is, you know, can I still is my question still relevant? How do I modify that? Um, and then maybe, you know, I'm coming at that from looking at it from a different perspective. Um, which means I'm, I, uh, I could do a survey, right? So to me, I think I, it's hard to say, okay, what are the, the theories? Because you really have to look at what people have done and what your question is that you want to research um, to have those stuff bubble up. And, and I usually start, I mean, you know, with our students, it's like, okay, look at the basket of eight um, and then kind of go from there, right? But it, um, I don't know, but I want to make sure what George, I mean, uh, Fred has time to look like he wanted to say something there earlier. Oh, I always want to say something. <laughs> I have a, a big mouth. Um, um, I think George is absolutely right. A method is is a tool. I, I I remember in grad school, we would come up with lots of questions. In fact, that was part of our assignments. And uh, Gordon Davis used to say that there are, um, I don't know if he said countless or infinite numbers of questions. So you may as well pick out the questions where whether you support or refute, you still have something interesting to say. That was one of his criteria for a question. My observation over these years is that certain kinds of questions are invisible to people who have a mindset that's already committed to a, a paradigm of research. And I think uh, Eleanor doing both qualitative and quantitative things is I, I don't know how many people do that. I, I, I would guess an exception uh, rather than uh, the rule. And I think George is absolutely right. If you only know uh, uh, surveys, uh, then it's like the old expression, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, but on the other hand, I think that the kind of questions that get addressed well by qualitative and cases tend to get screened out. I know Gordon Davis refused to do qualitative dissertations for the very good reason that he said he didn't know enough about how to give guidance. Very fair. So everybody did a quantitative study, and then you were free to go learn on your own how to do a qualitative work. And that's unreasonable. That's not unreasonable. So if we have a, a proportionate number of people who do, do qualitative, quantitative, intermediate, or both, and that gets reflected in the next generation, we're pretty much locked in. And, and I think that it would take concerted effort to begin to consciously decide what sort of mix we want and, and, and move toward that. 
Now, I think one of the reasons why there's an identity crisis is that we have so many small groups. I don't know what we have, 20 special interest groups in uh, AIS, give or take five, maybe. And uh, about 35 in ACM. Uh, and I don't know about other groups. So all of these have some number of members, which are way less than a majority of people. So I think what tends to happen is a lot of people end up identifying with their own group rather than with the entire um, uh, spectrum. And being so small, it's possible for every group to feel like an underdog, like they're not fully respected because many of us think our group is the most important to the point even of the only one, right? Um, and uh, so I think that the identity issue comes a lot from somebody who say an economist who feels the economists are not treated well enough. Therefore, I must argue for an economics component of the ISO or an economics lens. So I think that as long as we have a field of lots of pluralities of people, that will continue to be a social political tug of war. Most people decide what they're interested in and that's what they're gonna do. People who are on the periphery, say in health information systems, and feel like that's not sufficiently treated, or design science, or they have an issue. I think the biggest problem with things like design science is that there are multiple flavors and there are different sets of criteria. And inevitably, if you do a design science, your reviewers will include somebody who is ideologically um, committed to a different flavor. And no matter what you do, you can't appease them without shifting to their flavor. I saw this in grounded theory. Uh, for many, many years. So just learning how to do design science, unless you learn all the flavors, is, is a tough job in itself. And I think the same thing with, um, we have a design science department, CIS, and I think we get great, great work. But you know, nine out of 10 of the papers are literature reviews and not people actually doing design science. I almost automatically accept people doing, building an artifact. I don't care about kernel theory. If they build an interesting artifact, an interesting topic, or even a component, it, it, it's, it's really encouraged to get through our system. Um, I've gotten off topic again here and I can't remember the original question. Uh, it's about, so what do you do? Uh, I think that the standard advice is, first of all, CIS is unlike other journals. So if you aim for us, you probably have reduced your probability of an easy acceptance somewhere else. If you apply somewhere else and come to us, you have new barriers to cross. So it's a tricky wicket asking people to, to write for us. There are dozens of other journals where a really standard incremental paper is quite welcome if, if it's well done. I'm often recommending people go to those journals with, with no, no fault, nothing wrong with their paper, just sort of not for us, so to speak. So, I'm sending with a question. No, it's just that uh, when Fred mentioned the metaphor of the having a hammer in their hands, that was exactly what I was uh, thinking of uh, here. Uh, and uh, well, I didn't know that Fred Davis had such a, you know, such a hammer in his hands uh, when, <laughs> but but uh, but I also agree that it's fair. It was, it was, uh, it was Gordon Davis, wasn't it? Gordon Davis. Gordon Davis. Davis. Sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, uh, but but and I, I do think that it's it's fair and it's comfortable that we as advisors uh, are inclined to research certain well use certain topics certain tools because they're the ones that we are more acquainted with. The problem with that is that we choose the methodology or the, the tools before we decide on the problem. And uh, what is relevant in life is our problems, right? Uh, probably even better than the, the solution that we give them, but, but at least the, the problems are, are what really matters. Even uh, worse, already, Alexander, we already have the data and we have the methodology. We haven't had the problem <laughs> defined. <laughs> that seems to much, be a problem. Much less the seminal theory to support it, right? Can I can I jump in on that real quick? Just because yeah, I do sure. want to, like when people are working together, I know we're not necessarily talking about this, but one of the things I find that's really important is your network of researchers, like your co-authors and that, right? And so one of the things that has allowed me to be able to work, you know, to say, okay, we have this question, wow, we really need to look at it from a qualitative perspective because there's not much out there about this, right? I don't have to be the expert on that, right? But by collaborating with somebody else who does, not only do I learn, right? But, but they are making sure that we are staying within whatever that has to be. And then surveys, you know, that could, that's kind of where I came up with, with web qual and instrument development. And so, you know, I lend to that. So I do think like, that's one of the things that I do with the, my PhD students. And I think it's really important just in general is that you cannot be the expert at all, just like um, Gordon Davis was saying, right? But 
you have to surround your people surround yourself with people and co-authors who do have that so when you're looking at how to do something somebody can can make sure that that method is done properly and that you can focus on what is the right question to then pick that methodology let me reinforce that you don't have to look at small questions you can think in terms of research uh, streams and look at large questions and different people focusing on different sub questions can look at it different ways but i would add oh, yeah. now that we've had the COVID experience and we're all experts at zoom and whatever this is teams uh google mm -hmm. teams, um why don't we build libraries of expert folks talking about different research methods why don't we support teams of people who can float from university across universities uh, talking about the, 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 I mean, when Gordon Davis said he didn't do qualitative, there were maybe five people in the world who did in IS, if that. Now mm -hmm. there's probably 500. So um, AIS setting up seminars that supplement and, and complement PhD programs, it would only require people to admit that they don't know everything. Uh, and libraries and, and, and seminars and uh, mentors that are not on call, you know, but available. Um, these are uh, these are readily available and should be part of the arsenal of our tactics to demonstrate to everybody in the world how you use what we learned from COVID, even when people want to go back to the classroom and forget about online, to enhance the in-classroom and the whole educational experience. Fred, I think that like what you're saying is spot on and we so the impact it grant that we're, we're working on um the first year the one thing that came out of it i know i spoke to this group a while ago um is this idea from the working groups came out this idea of ais academy because as an ai being a part of ais is not just being a north american researcher or an american researcher right it's global and we have a lot of people in our community that don't have access to the simple concepts, right? So we're talking, you know, you, to, to what are they, they're going into the profession, not realizing the importance, George, of that we're here to do research or that at some component, we have to be able to think at that level. And so how do you help people be successful in their careers, right? Because we want to help. And so I think the, this, this idea of it, the AIS Academy came up where, where can we not just do lectures or things like that, but allow people to share this type of information where you can have somebody in, let's say, the continent of Africa who may not have, you know, who's who's expected now to do some research but has never been able to be trained, that they can actually have some of these resources. So I think what you're saying is a great idea. And I think the a, you know, an AIS Academy that that looked at that would be um, a good a good way of including that. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, uh, Fred and Leonor, because Mostly in Latin America, uh, the research is, is not much. We have a few research in, in, in our topic in MIS. The mm -hmm. MIS community uh, is uh, not that big, like in, in other you know, continents. Mm -hmm. But Latin America has uh, main problems. And sometimes you know, they needed to be known around. And, and we don't have those libraries. We don't have the name of the researchers uh, uh, and the topics they are, they are experts in. So I think it's uh, Alexander. The next talk, the next, the next task. <laughs> for, we can we for... can start recruiting the, uh, the the three of the panelists for our expertise because that's exactly what we're doing. I and mean, with the seminar, we're trying yeah. to expose everybody to a particular methodology or a particular expertise. So, yeah. uh, we started with you talking about the seminar work, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean the rest what follows is going specific on each one of the uh, of the topics. So that's one thing I like to what to when I, when I when give a talk at a school. I often stay and listen to the doctoral students or whomever present their work and give feedback. I think I did this in Kansas when I visited you there, George. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, this is a great model. So if you have five or six students ready to present proposals or whatever, and you bring in people to make comments from anywhere in the world, you know, and, and especially from a variety of places, um, you know, if you do that, say, once a month, I, I think you'd, you'd have a great a great um, uh, program. Alexander. No, what, what I was going to say precisely to what Eleanor was uh, saying is that, and, and Fred as well, uh, COVID has, it's interesting that we are in the IS field for, for, for that long and we, we had not realized how easy it is to share. It's not only to, to, to share expertise, it's also to share our ignorance, but also listening to other people that are 
that, that have a better knowledge on, on specific topics. So one of our dreams in, in, in Latin America and Aurora was also say our challenge here is that uh, we don't have, except for maybe one or two programs, we don't have IS programs, at least not in, in the business schools. Uh, some, some of the, the computer science schools do have IS programs in Latin America, but then they, 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 they're focused on, on more on the technology than, than on, on, on other topics that are, are dear to us. But mm -hmm. what, we, what we thought and what we think of when we think of these research seminars and, and when we try to get together is that, well, if we are only one or two IAS professors in each of these universities, but if we can get together and maybe it's, let's say at one stage, I hope that we can say, well, Monday morning, maybe it's, it's difficult to say Monday morning because what is morning for me mm -hmm. is, uh, well, it's, it, it is very early morning for Aurora, right, in, in, in Chile or, uh, but anyway, Monday, whatever time, uh, yeah, this, this is going to be our IAS time. And then we have professors from different countries sharing the same, the same class. And, mm -hmm. and each one of us talking about the things that we know best and at the same time sharing ideas because, I mean, I think the, the best ideas we get is when someone talks about something that we had never thought of. And, and, and this happens often when we have a panel like this or when we, uh, you know, uh, when, when we simply have different, for example, I always see, uh, I've seen many of uh, George's talks over the years. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes I think, George, that, well, the, the reality that you talk about, let's say, is it, it's very important to inform us, but at the same time, it's very different to the reality that we live uh, we have to be much more practical, even when we're trying to do research and, and when we're trying to develop yeah. science, we cannot do it the same way as probably some of the most rigorous schools will, will be doing in, in the United States. We simply, we, we, we don't have the critical uh, power at our ends. And at the same time, our students uh, 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 and, and, and probably those who hire them are not interested necessarily in, in those people. Although uh, we're sure that maybe some of our be our best professors will have to be, let's say, formed in your schools, but then we'll have to do something slightly different. You may even uh, uh, consider, is that still something that we should be doing in, in, in graduate schools? Well, I don't know, but, but, but that's something that we can, can do in our graduate schools in, in, in Latin American universities. So it's, it's good to see the different points of views, the different perspectives. And this is something so rich that we only got to because we now have, I mean, a tool that, what, that had been around for many years mm -hmm. and we had disregarded it because we thought that we had to be there with our own students, right? So it's okay. it's great to see uh, what what happens in a panel like this because I, I think I think we have I think we have a, a, a choice that's always available to any institution if you want to focus uh, the reward structure and the the impetus of, of learning toward applied research I think that's as valid as focusing towards theoretical research just don't lie about it. Okay. If you're going to do applied research, then understand that things like generalizability have a different meaning. Uh, if you're going to do applied research, understand that that doesn't mean you are void of theory. It means that theory is the lens you look through that tells you what should have happened. And then you take those glasses off and you look at what did happen. And the difference between what should have happened and what did happen is where your research should be. Okay. So doing applied research is extremely valid. We have a, 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 a very successful DBA program. And I, and I look forward to teaching it. Interestingly, I'm teaching research methods in it, and I'm teaching exactly the same thing to my doctoral students that I'm teaching to the DBA students. Because whether you're doing applied research or theoretical research, and understanding the basic scientific method and research methods is essential. Which arena you put it in, that's a different story. But applied research isn't a way to get around the rigors of theoretical research or the boredom of theoretical research. And theoretical research isn't a way to completely ignore the applied community. Okay, uh, we, 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 there's, it's a big tent, you know, that's, that's a great metaphor. It's a, it's a big tent and, and, and everybody can fit under it. But I think that places that, that don't do well in the applied community might do, or in the theoretical community, don't do well because they don't have people trained well in the theoretical community. And people that aren't doing well in the applied community <clears throat> have the same challenges. <clears throat> you can't say, well, because we're not, you know, we can't compete in the theoretical community, we'll just pretend we understand applied research. It, mm -hmm. It's really time that we set a foundation. There's a right, there's a hundred wrong ways to do it. And there's only a handful of right ways to do it, but they're hard. And they require an investment in time and inclination. And I think we've lost that in, in many arenas. Well, can I jump in with just with Alex, yeah. another point, but also kind of tangentially to what George is saying that I think it's really one of the things that I find um, most helpful because we 
I have my PhD students were back at WPI, and so, um, you know, we didn't have large seminars that we were going to. So another faculty member and I actually did one just for our students. And the thing that I think is helpful that we can use through Zoom and what you're talking or, or teams or whatever, right, is to get together. Because what we found are there were things like we had read Kuhn, right, and we we're making our students read Kuhn. And, and, and so the idea of it is like we got something out of it. Right, we remembered things again. And so I don't want to say, you know, I, I, especially to your students, like we are forever students. Um, and just because we have, you know, we've got that doctorate doesn't mean that we're not, we're not learning again, learning more, that we shouldn't go back and revisit things because we looked at things and we, the other faculty member and I looked at each other and we're like, wow, we really got, we got a different layer out of doing this again with the students. And so I think with students as other faculty members going through that, um, and talking and meeting people from other areas, that's important too. So I think it, 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 that enhances our learning as well. I don't think it's just the students. I don't think we reach this pinnacle level and then it's like, okay, your, your professors, you're done in learning or knowing that. I think it's really important that we continue it um, for our own good and, for, and, and by helping ourselves, right, and kind of getting that higher level and looking at things differently, we then help our students as well. Hey, thank you, Elena. Guillermo has a question. I have to take us back a little bit to the original point of the panel and ask George, Eleanor, and Fred if you can uh, recognize any particular work in the last 20 or 25 years that you could consider a second wave or, so to speak, seminal work that is a new pillar, that the constitute the new pillars of the IS discipline. I don't know if that made any sense with my question. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by second wave. Right, it's like a, we know. I mean, we were there. There was the first generation. They did this great job, and 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 probably, as you said, now the new students they don't know their work because for some reason it's not being important to cite them and to know what they did in the past. Okay, I don't know. Whatever, what it is, good or bad, but there, I, you know, there it, must guess, be really strong work, right? That has been done in the past 20, 25 years that might be becoming the new grounds for the discipline. I don't know. I'm just being devil's advocate here. So I would, I would recommend if I mean. I, I, I had an interesting conversation with a couple of people at AMSIS because I just wanted to see if I was the only one that saw this, but um, I had one of them, you know, when I was talking about teaching, you know, the, the, the seminal work in the field, he said, well, you know, the problem is, you know, trying to get 10 pounds in a five pound bag, you know, we, we can't spend all our time talking about the fundamental literature uh, because then we wouldn't have time to do our 16 week seminar in cybersecurity and the other 16 week seminar in health informatics and the other 16 week seminar in design science. Okay. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, let's, let, let's not let, let, let's not let the fundamental tools get in the way of a perfectly good doctoral program. Uh, so uh, it, I think, I think the answer directly to your question, if, if we're not going to teach it, uh, at least we should make our students aware of it. Um, you know, there's a great, paper publication in JIS by Rudy Hirschheim and Heinz Klein. It was back in, uh, I'm going to say 2012, but, but I'm not sure if I'm correct. Uh, you know, a glorious and, and not so short, not so small history of the information systems field. And they go through and identify uh, everything that happened and why it was important and where, why it needs to be carried forward. And, and and from an overview of the field to uh, the, its inception to its current development, at least through 2012. Um, and, and I think they identify a lot of things that we would want our students to be aware of and perhaps bring to bear in their own understanding and research. So if, if, if we're going to skip the, the foundation of the field and redefine it every year and have our annual identity crisis, fine. Um, but, you know, let's at least not pretend that it doesn't exist. That, that paper, by the way, was a winner that year of the best paper award. Uh, and I, I think it's a little more recent than 2012. I, I would add another one that I cite a lot in almost every paper lately. And I don't remember the other authors, but um, Supratik Sarkar was one of them. And he, I'm sorry, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember the title. I should have, um, I should have looked it up before our, our session today. But um, he basically talks about the different um, major components of IS, and he argues that the socio-technical is the central, with the technical side spinning out in one direction and the social science side spinning out in the other, kind of like I talked about healthcare 
you have the socio-technical elements, and then you spin out into more and more of the medical uh, until you get outside of IS. There's a fuzzy boundary. Nobody really knows where it is. Um, if you, um, uh, uh, if there's time, I can look it up and send it to people in the chat. Yeah, um, would be nice. Okay, I'll do that. The same, George. If you could copy the, the articles uh, uh, name there and 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 show the students. Sure, sure. I can definitely do that. I don't have so I was looking I will say I was looking to see what I thought because I what papers were out there and I was trying to search to see from the things that I had looked at what I thought would be most appropriate to bring up here. Um, and it really it, it differs. I mean, I would say the socio technical is something I always come back to. And so because I'm so, because I feel like we focus so much on the technical and not the social part and that's the part that's really interesting to me. So I would agree with Fred. Um, I, I do have and also I must say I looked at some different people's um, research seminars, their syllabi to see what they were teaching and all of them were different, George. <laughs> so I would say, I mean, that's kind of what we get, right, is, is their perspective. And so it would kind of be interesting to see if, if there were some seminal pieces that we could put together to kind of help people doing that to, to arrange things around it. Um, but I do, the one thing I do wanna say, there are some resources in terms of the theories that have been used in IS. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I think it's, I want to say it's like Colorado that's putting that together or somebody has maybe somebody else knows, but there are they are they do have a spot where um, they're listing all of the theories that have been used in IS um, as a resource. And so I think sometimes that's helpful to see what's been used um, if you're going to go and look at, you know, like what are the, the important theories within IS? Um, and I, I could look at I could try and send it to you or Guillermo to um, put out there, but I know that they're okay. You have it right there. Is that it? Oh, no, that's other. I, I will look and I will try and find it and send it to you where that that is listed. Everybody, I, I'm going to jump in here real quick. I have to jump off um, because I have a meeting with a, a doctoral student uh, <laughs> on a dissertation in four minutes. I have really, really enjoyed being a part of this and I always enjoy being a part of the uh, the Latin American AIS uh, research seminar. So so uh, please endeavor without me, and uh, and I'll look forward to the next opportunity. Thank you, thank thank you all. Thank you so much, much. George. Thank Always you good to see you, George. All your insights. Thank you. So um, regarding the the, the 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 questions that uh, Guillermo was uh, asking regarding the seminar work, and um, what do you think uh, the students uh, should should look at? When they are looking for good methodologies in qualitative research uh, from Fred, because qualitative research is something that uh, students need to look at, but looking for good research papers uh, with good quality, qualitative research is going to be a good suggestion. And how, what would you could suggest for them? For them? There's a, um, gosh, I, I, I can't pronounce her name. Um, uh, she's an Eastern European woman. It's something like C E Z E Z, um, a hyphen, something else. Um, and she's written about voting systems in Brazil, actually. Oh. And, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really exemplary uh, paper. Um, for methodology itself, I think Michael Myers is usually really good. Um, I, I have some issues with Walter Fernandez's paper on grounded theory. The issue is that he tends to say, here are the 12 elements, you must have them all. But they are the 12 elements and they each are really good. Um, and so it's, if you take it with a grain of salt uh, and, and say, hey, I can learn something from this, I think it's a, a really good uh, paper. Kathy Urquhart mm -hmm. uh, is, a really, uh, is, a good, is a good author for uh, grounded theory. There's an excellent book on grounded theory, which is almost never referenced by a woman named Karen Locke, L-O-C-K-E, I think. Mm -hmm. and it's called Grounded Theory in Business Research. Right. It's a much more pragmatic view than uh, Glazer and Strauss or any of the others, which are much more esoteric uh, views. This is more about how to do it than about what the rules should be. Um, and, and I found it to be an excellent uh, guide for Grounded Theory. There's a, a book written about 40 years ago. Uh, and one of the authors was Deborah Armstrong, but I think she was the second author. And a fellow with a East Indian name was the first author. It didn't come back to me. 
on something called cognitive or causal mapping, extremely underused. Um, the first time I ever ran into it was from, from George in a paper he used it. Um, but a, a tremendously effective uh, tactic, in my opinion. Um, great, great suggestion. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, do you have some suggestion for the students, Eleanor, for, for, for qualitative? Or, or how to get, you design a, a research um, um, instrument that is well known worldwide. And how you, did you come back, to, did, did you arrive to this, this uh, design? Can you tell us a little bit how, how was the process of doing that? Oh, you are, you are mute. All right, there we go. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, Churchill, there was a paper by Churchill, um, and I can send you the, the site if you need it, but it's older and it talked about how instrument development um, should be done. Um, but, you know, the one thing is, is we talk about seminal pieces. I, I think it's also important to then look at, you know, kind of I tell my students that forward citation to see who's used it because somebody may have improved it or done some different things. So, for example, I had to do a lot of validation right of that instrument and so the things that i did back then to show the validation would be different today if i had to do it because things have the, the tools have changed and people have done more research um in looking at discriminant validity and um, convergent validity sorry and and so um i think it's important to kind of have those something you know, that would be what i would say would help but then i also look at some of the newer um, papers that are out there and like, let's say, MISQ to say, okay, how are people doing their validation for their instruments? Yeah. So even though I followed that method, you know, I kind of followed Churchill's methodology, I also had to look at what were the new, new, the new measures and how they were done. And then I would suggest again, now that I, I'm doing more, anytime I do another instrument, right, I have to go back and say, okay, what are, what are the, what am I going to have to go through to show that this is valid? And oftentimes, it, it may be a different method than what I had done the last paper because they had moved forward in terms of the, the um, knowledge on what, what's the better way to do it. I think uh, uh, we are just on time. So I would, I would like to, to, to ask for you a close, a close advice for the students, just very short, uh, if you want them to find a good research topic. So what, what, and what Indira, you did a research right? her hands, uh, maybe okay. before. Because... Yes, I wanted to, to make sure that you see that I was here and was, I'm not a robot, but thank you so much for such a great discussion. You know, the philosophical part of that, making us really think about uh, the potential. Um, I, I mean, I, I like it, uh, the idea that we um, can think about topics of research. You know, it's not just like uh, uh, it's that what is published is a law and, you know, there's no way you can get there. It's just really uh, opening the doors for, for research. And I really love the idea that we are being more inclusive into qualitative research. And so I hope we, we, we one of the topics here we're going to have on, on qualitative research and then applied research that George mentioned. And of course, uh, Eleanor with the uh, diversity. Uh, so I think uh, I, I want to think that information systems research is being more inclusive in, in a way, you know, opening doors to others, uh, other, um, you know, less traditional ways of doing research because it was all very posit positivistic approach and quantitative mm -hmm. approach and, you know, very theoretical. But uh, this kind of discussion, I think it's very important to open those kind of doors and think, oh, yeah, you know what, actually, maybe I could do research in that area. Maybe it's, I, I could get published. But, but of course, as, as Alexander and, and Aurora were, were saying, uh, the problem is in, in, in Latin America, the incentive is different, right? The incentive, it's many mm -hmm. students do doctoral, do, do their PhD in Latin America just um well less people of course but also the um uh, the tools and the and sometimes english is a barrier right so um so i, I think that's um that's mm -hmm. hopefully it's changing i want to think that you know the information system research is being more inclusive and uh, just going to also what Aurora was asking i just wanted to see uh, what other ways do you think information system research is being more inclusive um again i, I want to say that that's happening and but uh, if you have anything else but thank you again for for a great panel thank you Indira. thanks Indira. Do you want me to jump in on that one? And <laughs> yeah, please. Sure. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, so I've seen over my 20 something years in the field going from, um, you know, if you're not researching the typical user, it's not valuable to us. And who is the typical user, right? If you're, if you are um, replicating in a different country, as, you know, Fred had alluded to with kind of this idea of replication, that it's not, 
it's not worth it. And what we've found, and I'm just going to use my own personal experience from working on the impact IT grant is that there are huge differences. So I know, and I, uh, you know, George isn't here, but 1 of the things George mentioned was about, um, kind of, you know, you, you build this. The, the theory and you build the literature within and, and you kind of have to go through and and, and reference that and I, I totally agree but I think that also the thing that we didn't do is it was it was very North American centric and so I think now opening it up to where we're saying hey you know we built this and it was built on looking at US uh, or, you know citizens who were answering these questions or maybe European um, but that, you know, but that there's some difference. And so adding what Fred had said, we may have missed a lot of things in that. And so there's, there's opportunity to, to open that up. And I think that's what we're starting to do now. We have um, the SIG social inclusion, the AS women's network. I think some of those things helped us start to see that there was value in doing this. And there were, there were people who wanted to work in this area. Um, because I think what was happening, I mean, we, in a study, we did a JS paper, um, a few years ago with uh, Gita Gupta and um, Jason Datcher and I, we looked at uh, the satisfaction, work satisfaction of the, with the members of the AIS. And what we found is that um, men had a direct satisfaction from their university. So how, you know, was impacted by what their university did for them and helped them. And with women, it was both the AIS and their university. And so that what we found, so the, what that is saying, how we interpreted that is that AIS as a community was very important to women, um, which makes sense based on the previous theory that looks at that women and how the, the, the build relationships and satisfaction. And so, so to me, that means, you know, wanting to work together to look at different issues. And that is, is something that was really important and high on, on, um, women's rate, women's researchers radars and others as well. I don't want to just say that, but I think that that's the thing is that we we're finally coming to the point where it's okay when I first started, you know, looking at research with people with disabilities and that again, it wasn't the typical user. They don't, you know, and now it's accepted. And what that, what that does is really make it more exciting for me and more exciting for others, because I think it expands our field and allows us to look at more things. Um, and to work with people who are coming from different perspectives. And so I do think that we are being more accepting of being diversifying um, what we look at, who gets to look at that, who we're including in our groups, you know, in our, in our co-authorships and that to be able to do it. So I, I think we are growing in that direction. I hope it's not, I hope it's not a fad, as, you know, as some people may think. But to me, I think what, with the impact IT grant, what we're hoping is that we, we're putting things in place and getting the AIS to look at things so that um, we don't go backwards in a sense, right? That we are we look at our the membership from a global perspective. That we look at how do we help, you know, that we validate the fact that there's people who are going to be doing more applied research and that there's people who are going to be more looking at the theoretical frameworks and that. And, that, and then that's okay, that, you know, we, we're a big community. We can, we can have people doing those different things and, and that's okay. I don't know, Fred, if you... Without disagreeing with anything you said, I think it's it's all uh, correct. Um, I think that what you have is a origin of the field that was dominated is the wrong word, but it was populated by a lot of white men at elite schools for whom everything else but their views were invisible. I don't think they sat down, knowing people like Gordon Davis, I, I don't think they sat down and said, how can we exclude anybody? Yeah. But they built the ground rules in such a way that you're welcome to accept their norms and address their issues. If you want to do that on their terms, then you, you have the opportunity to do that. And some women did that successfully. Um, and some actually did that marginally and successfully like um, um, Lynn Marcus and uh, 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 Carol Saunders, Sanders. Um, they largely accommodated those rules, but put their own edge on things, right? And I think that the challenge is to say, are those rules ones, and I mean, I mean rule in a very broad sense, rules, norms, expectations, uh, culture, ones that need to be uh, um, uh, maintained. Now, a lot of traditionalists, feel that they should. And that's why there's conflict and why there's difficulty when people say, no, we have some, 
some other priorities. So issues like uh, um, life work balance, it's not an issue to most of the, you know, white men who have either are bachelors or have, uh, you know, spouses of whatever kind taking care of their every need. It's just not, it's invisible. It's just like, I remember at a college of senior scholars meeting, these guys were talking about, and they were all guys, talking about um, how they couldn't place their students because Carnegie Mellon and, you know, uh, Pittsburgh had no openings. I'm like, you know, there's 500 other schools and half of them have openings. It was invisible to them that somebody would go to, uh, you know, UT Arlington or our University of Texas at El Paso, where people actually spend 95% of their time training students, go, go figure. Uh, <laughs> So I, I think that the challenge for um, diversity is gaining acceptance for alternative ways of thinking and mindsets, asking different kinds of questions, not addressing them with surveys that look at the typical user and ignore the, uh, uh, the edges, the, the variance. You know, this is my problem with a lot of quali quantitative, uh, it's not that quantitative, but why only report the averages or the means? Why not report the ranges and the distribution? And why not interview the people who were outliers instead of just throwing them out of the data? Why not ask why are we these questions not loading on our factor analysis instead of throwing them out so that we get good loadings? Yeah. I mean, this is a pseudoscience when it comes to many of the standard practices of our yeah. And I have to, I have a perfect example, if you don't mind me jumping in, Fred, that kind of talking about this idea of, you know, the, the fringes and that. So, and, and why it's so practical, right? So there is um, a woman who, who gave a talk at a, a conference I was attending and she said, you know, we were talking about the, the ethics of all of this, of kind of leaving people out, right? And especially with the new technologies. And so she said, okay, she has a friend who is, um, has cystic fibrosis. And so she is in a wheelchair and she moves backwards so that's she uses her feet to kind of go backwards so if she's crossing the road she doesn't go forward she goes backwards so she was talking you know, to, to a company that was doing some autonomous vehicle uh tests and so they said okay well you know let's we're, we're testing or whatever let's see what happened let, let's see what would happen if your friend were, were crossing the street so the friend they did the test to see what it would be like put the you know the data in or whatever and they in the car would hit her right because it was outside of that so they said, wait, we're going to do some fine tuning. We're going to do this again. And we're going to look and see, you know, how we do this. Well, the car, you know, so as they went and they, they progressed in their testing and that they did it again and the car not only hit her, it hit her with more accuracy. Right? So the idea here is that when, when we talk about the practicality, a lot of what we're doing and what we're studying, right, is, is how much we can leave people, like how much damage we can do to society if we are not looking at these issues. Um, and, and, you know, and I have students looking at smart cities for people with disabilities and that and kind of, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we need to be looking at. And as Fred said, you know, this is the same type of thing. What is this range? What are we, what are the outliers telling us? Because we may have one outlier in this particular data set, but when you compound that, and if you're saying, and, and how much value is it to make sure that we don't hit that person, right? Because we can figure out not how to not to hit that person. Right, so just, you know, the idea that wheelchairs move forward is not the, the, the case for everybody. But go ahead, Fred, you had it. You know, I, I, not only do I agree, I think it's a fabulous example. I'm going to steal it uh, from my <laughs> next paper. Uh, but um, I, I think this goes to the essential nature of causality. And you now in AI, causality is, is really weird, right? Mm -hmm. What causes an AI to think that your friend or your friend's friend is, is you know, um, worth running over? Um, or it doesn't matter, or whatever it is. I mean, this, this is all about the the, con the social context within which all technology um, uh, um, is um, is created and used. Um, yeah. And I think that that's why if you talk about influence, it's a natural distribution of factors or constructs or, or whatever it might be, rather than looking for the three most important things. And forgetting the rest. Because in real life, if there are 20 influences, you almost never know which one's going to come to the fore this time. Mm -hmm. That's why I love um, this contrarian named Taleb and, and the black swan, you know, and guarding against the 
unexpected and resilience instead of, you know, brittleness. And um, so I think it's a not mindset. And I think that for the bulk of people in IS, these issues are just invisible. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, oh, sorry. In some cases, it really doesn't matter if it doesn't work for everybody. Right. But you can't know that. And, and my, my solution to that, by the way, although I wouldn't want to run over your friend, that's not <laughs> like the other thing, but if it's just a matter of money, then you have a big fund that anybody who uses AI has to contribute to, like a no-fault insurance on your car. I don't know if you do that in South America but or Central America, but in the U.S., we have this no-fault insurance. So everybody pays in. And if you're in an accident, the fund or the insurance company pays your damages, regardless of whose fault it is. But the, the, the amount collected across the border from individuals will change, you know. And uh, that seems to me like what you should do with AI. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't help somebody who's run over. Uh, but but, uh, but that's, a, that's another issue. But I, but I do think it brings us to the idea of this idea of, of, of um, we, we tend to look at psychology when we look at users a lot of times, right, in the IS. And, and this idea of sociology um, can be just as important. And some of the other, like, you know, we we talk about critical disability theory and things like that, um, that there's some of these other things that I think we're, we're able to look at in terms of the theoretical frameworks that we weren't able to bring in before. Um, well, this is, this is why I have a problem with psychology and sociology as reference disciplines, because it may have changed. But when I studied psychology, it was entirely about how all human brains work. Mm -hmm. It was not about well, you learn this. And I thought with cognitive psychology, we would start getting about the variance. But mm -hmm. it came quickly about, you know, minutia in microseconds that mm -hmm. does not translate at all into a six month decision of what new accounting system to buy. Yeah. Or what new ERP yeah. to do, you know, whether or not to upgrade to a new version, right? So psychology to me is a very good science for asking about what human brains do. Mm -hmm. what people normally do. But it doesn't ask questions about the range of how people are going to respond to a new technology or socio-technical issues where you have variables where you can have settings in the, in the uh, let's say, the, the Facebook. And as those settings change, what's seen and reactions change, and they both can change at the same time. So you have thousands of combinations. Yeah. You, you know, if that's your research question, no survey is going to answer that. Right. Maybe an experiment could pick out a few. Anyway. Thank you so much. I think this this conversation is so interesting. We could spend the whole morning doing that. And I appreciate your your time, your insight, and all your knowledge, Eleanor, Fred. And I think that Alexander is on time, I think, for the seminar. So he has the final words. Yeah, who, okay. Who, that, who do I send my bill to, Alex or Gamma? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The, the problem is not who you send your bill to. It's, it's about your expectation of having the bill paid by anyone, you know? For your uh, voluntary and uh, philanthropist deposit to the Lakais uh, yeah. uh, Foundation. Because if you talk in our seminars, you have to pay. <laughs> it's, it's different, yeah. It's, we, we, we think differently to the way you usually think. Okay. Remember we're talking about cultural differences? <laughs> I'll, I'll write that check right now here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, anyway, well, thank you very much, uh, Fred and Lenore. Uh, well, George is not with us any longer, but it's, uh, we have to thank him uh, and, and Aurora for having uh, moderated the panel and Guillermo for being there all the yeah. time. You notice that he didn't even turn his camera off that often. Wow. Uh, I, I did turn it off for quite a while. Yeah. Time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what we'll be doing next week, well, well, we have a lot of things that came out uh, of this uh, uh, panel today. Of course, we'll have to, to think, and, and, and I hope that the students start thinking about uh, Ob objectives for their research, objects that uh, they can use in, in, in their research in, in IS. But and uh, no, it's, to a, a, it's to run an essay of, uh, of the conclusions of the panel. Yeah, there, 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 there's no way we can think of uh, our objectives without thinking of the methodology that we'll end up using. So we'll definitely have to go back to methodologies and discuss the possibilities of quantitative, qualitative, and different perspectives and all of that. Uh, but to make it easy, next week, well, last week or the week before, we, we worked on, uh, we, we told them why not to write essays, Fred. And I was sort of giving them an example of a, a, a paper that uh, uh, that Eusebio uh, Skornavak and I sent to, to, to Kaiser, the difficulties of, of having essay, essays uh, uh, published. Uh, and, well, you know, the uh, and, of, of Kaiser is terrible, so. 
the, the, the editor of Kais is, is really mean. Uh, and, yeah, he's and, mean and is he's yeah. trying to get him to and, buy and some beers at the next conference. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, but we, we were telling them that writing essays is a very well, it's probably a, the easiest uh, kind of work to write because we have a lot of freedom, but it's the most difficult kind of work to publish uh, unless uh, it's an invited essay, right? So uh, next ne next time uh, next Monday we will we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the let's say in in Portuguese we would say the the well no well there's no way I can translate that but anyway the the, the way to go to get published and uh, and or at least an easy way to go to get published uh, which means writing a theoretical empirical paper that is usually interesting even to those who wrote the theory the, the original theory because your th your theoretical empirical paper will either challenge things that have already uh, been done, we'll, we'll maybe show, uh, if, if we write an interesting paper, we'll maybe show some of the outliers that were left out of the, the original theory, uh, or we'll even uh, um, uh, show that the new theory has to be uh, written because the, the old theory doesn't explain all the, all the possibilities. So we will work on a theoretical empirical paper, and we will sort of work on a recipe to write papers. Of course, later we'll have to you know, polish that up to make sure that uh, our, our our paper gets to be a, a, an interesting uh, paper, but some of the clues are we're already here today, right? We have to have the right objective. We have to write and have the right methodology. Uh, well, uh, if we if we are to 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 be more theoretical, we have to rigor is going to be very important. If we want to be more practical, we will work on on the relevance, but we can't forget uh, uh, rigor either. Uh, so all of that will be discussed uh, next week and, and later on, and maybe if Eleanor, or Fred, if you also have ideas of people who we could invite to talk about some specific qualitative method or some specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, way of going with, 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 with the research, we will appreciate ideas uh, later on. Okay, so I guess okay. that's yeah. it for today. Thank you very much for Thank being you. with us.